Okay, so we talked earlier about both types of electrochemical cells. Galvanic cells, or voltaic cells, same diff, and then versus electrolytic cells. Now your galvanic cells, your voltaic cells, those are the spontaneous ones. So they have positive voltages, they produce electricity. But again, your electrolytic cells, electrolysis, they have negative voltages, they use up electricity. And the diagram is a little different here. We usually don't have them divided up into half cells, with the exception being if we're recharging a battery. But again, one of the major uses for electrolysis, besides recharging a battery though, is to produce elements. And often elements that might otherwise be hard to find. But not always. So usually you have one solution. And you put both electrodes in that solution. But you have to have this thing hooked up to a power source. You've got to plug it into a battery. You've got to plug it into the wall. It needs power from somewhere to actually work. Electrons are still going to travel through the wire. They're still going to travel from anode to cathode. But again, one of the big differences between this and the, the galvanic cell is that even though the electrons still travel from anode to cathode, they don't want to. We're forcing them to travel this direction because now the anode is the positive electrode, the one in, with higher potential, and the cathode is negative, the one with lower potential. And electrons want to travel to the one with higher potential. We're forcing them to go the other way, the non-spontaneous direction. Usually when we do electrolysis, in this class we'll treat it as doing electrolysis on a salt. When I say salt, what do I mean again? Ionic compound, ionic compound. So in this case, the one on your handout, we're going to look at the electrolysis of NABR. Electrolysis of NABR. Sodium bromide, nice ionic compound, good salt. Now here's the deal. Electrolysis is only possible when ions are mobile, when they can move. In solid sodium bromide crystals, can the ions move around? No. And so you only got two options. You can melt the sodium bromide, and if you heat it up super hot, you can melt it. Like, anybody ever melt salt? You ever try? Just put some salt in a pan. No water, just salt in a pan and heat it up. You'd never get there. Your stove doesn't get hot enough. Ionic compounds typically have super high melting points. You want to melt like regular table salt, like 800 degrees or something like that. It's super high to do this, but you can. Industrially, we can get things that hot. But if I want ions to be able to move around, what's a lot easier way to get ions free, freely moving? Dissolve them in water. And so this is your two types of electrolysis. You can do what's called molten electrolysis or aqueous electrolysis, but you can't use a solid salt and try and do electrolysis because the ions aren't able to move in a solid salt. Where's the other time you've probably heard the, the word molten used? Molten lava. What is molten lava? Melted rock, right? What are rocks made of? Lots of ionic compounds in a lot of cases. And when you melt ionic compounds, they're molten, just like molten lava. So same diff. All right, here's the deal. What's the oxidation state for sodium to start with here? Plus one and bromine? Minus one. When you have a simple binary salt like this, predicting the products of electrolysis is super easy. We form both of these in their elemental forms. What's the elemental form for sodium? Sodium metal. What's the elemental form for bromine? Diatomic, but Br2. They form their elemental forms. Zero oxidation states for both. There's your products, done. Now here's the deal. I didn't put like liquid, and technically, you know what, I really shouldn't put solid here. Because if I have to heat this up super hot, sodium's probably going to be in the liquid phase at that point. So I don't want to put a phase, but they're going to be in their elemental forms as products. Electrolysis, we form elements. Not always, but pretty much always for the questions you'll see. Cool. Which one of these formed at the cathode and which one formed at the anode? 
Well, cathode, what happens at the cathode by definition? Reduced. Which one of these was the product of reduction? The sodium. And so here, what's nice is the cation gets reduced at the cathode. It makes it easy to remember. The half reaction, if you just split it up in half, Na plus plus an electron goes to Na. So here I've just written the total balance reaction, but now we're splitting it up into the separate half reactions. And then which product formed at the anode? Br2. And if I look at it as a half reaction, I've got 2Br minus going to Br2 plus two electrons. So if you notice, we probably got to do a couple of things here to make sure this is balanced. So, but now we've got our half reactions. Bromine, elemental bromine is formed at the anode. Elemental sodium is formed at the cathode. Predicting the product super easy. Cool. If you look at your table of half reaction potentials further up on the page in that text box again, what's the half reaction potential for sodium ions turning into sodium? Oh, it's not on there, is it? So I did provide it in that question, though. My bad. But it is negative 2.71 volts. It's actually provided down further for you. My bad. What is the oxidation potential for bromine? Well, notice, would you normally be given an oxidation potential? No, you're going to get a reduction potential. I've already turned it around for you on the sheet. As an oxidation, it is negative 1.07 volts. So then what would the overall E cell here be? What's the overall E cell going to be? Negative 2.78 volts. Does that make sense? Is that what it'll look? Oh, how about 3.78 volts? I can do math, simple math. I do logs in my head. Sure I do. So negative 3.78 volts. What this means, is this spontaneous under standard conditions first off? No. What this means is that if you want this to happen, your power source has to generate at least 3.78 volts for this to be even able to happen. That's why I said at least. But yeah, at least this much so to get it to go. Cool. Now let's look at the aqueous case. If you're doing molten electrolysis, predicting the products is so easy. And you just got to figure out cation gets reduced at the cathode, anion gets oxidized at the anode, so that way you know which element is which. Because you might say, you know, which, what are the products? And it might even specify which electrode each is at. But aqueous electrolysis sucks. Because what's present in aqueous electrolysis, that's not present in molten electrolysis. Water. And the problem is water can also get oxidized and reduced. And the key is when you actually do electrolysis, only one oxidation ever takes place at the anode. And only one reduction ever takes place at the cathode. And so the question is, is the cation getting reduced or is water getting reduced? Is the anion getting oxidized or is water getting oxidized? And so that's what we got to figure out now that we're transitioning to aqueous electrolysis. So again, for molten electrolysis, we'd be done. That's complete. For aqueous electrolysis, we have to take this one little step further. And so here, what we'd have to throw onto this list as well is I provided them again for you. So water, when it gets oxidized, it forms elemental oxygen. Notice oxygen goes from minus 2 up to the 0 oxidation state. That's oxidation. So we're still forming an element. We also form hydrogen ions, though. And water can also get reduced. So that's a possible reaction or half reaction at the cathode as well. And in this case, it produces elemental hydrogen. Also produces hydroxide, but the elemental hydrogen, we still get an element, at least, one way, shape, or form. OK. 
Okay. So now we have our two possible oxidations that could happen at the anode, and we have our two possible reductions that ha could happen at the cathode. But again, only one of each is actually going to happen. Whichever one is easier. And when I say easier, I either mean whichever one is more spontaneous or at least less non-spontaneous, if you will. Whichever one is more positive in voltage. So let's look at our cathode first. Which one of these numbers is more positive? And notice more positive means the same thing in this case as being less negative. So which one of these is actually easier? Yeah, the water. Water's way easier. Sodium doesn't get produced at all with aqueous electrolysis in this case. Only water gets reduced to form hydrogen gas and hydroxide. Oh, I totally provided that with you on your sheet as well. Oh, did I get them backward? Oh, you know what? That's right. That's 0.83. You're good. My bad. Let's get that correct. Still work out the same, but awesome. Thank you. But still more spontaneous than negative 2.71. Now the anode. The anion can get oxidized or water can get oxidized. Which one is easier? Yeah, in this case, the anion, bromine, is easier, or the bromide ion is easier to oxidize, and so you'll produce bromine. And so in this case, in aqueous electrolysis, bromine gets produced at the anode, but hydrogen gas and hydroxide gets produced at the cathode. So if you look here, can you still produce bromine, Br2, with aqueous electrolysis? Yeah, we just did it. So here's the deal. The advantage of doing aqueous electrolysis is it's way cheaper. You don't have to heat this stuff up. And when we're talking super hot temperatures in large quantities, the amount of energy expended to cause, you know, heat this stuff up and melt it is huge. So we'd way rather do aqueous electrolysis. And so if the goal was making bromine, by all means, let's do aqueous electrolysis. Way cheaper in industry. But if my goal was to make sodium metal, could we do aqueous? No. I could have said, hey, I'm the new guy in, in the company, but you know what? Let's, let's save some money. Let's do aqueous. And they'd fire me because I'm a moron. You can't get sodium metal in aqueous electrolysis in this case. You'd have to do it molten to be able to get the sodium. So my last question for you conceptually on this stuff, is look at your table of reduction potentials. Can you tell me, we couldn't produce sodium metal, but can you give me a metal that could be produced with aqueous electrolysis? Which one? Nickel. So why nickel? And that's totally correct. Because it's easier than water to get reduced. Anything that's more positive than negative 0.83 could be a metal that you could produce. So nickel would qualify if you look on your handout. Cobalt qualifies, iron qualifies, chromium qualifies, zinc qualifies, silver qualifies. But out of the ones in your list there, manganese and aluminum can't do it. So you could get a question, because this table, again, will probably be provided for you in the front of your exam. Could be which of the following metals could be produced with aqueous electrolysis? And you've got to compare them to this. These numbers would also be given to you for water as well, by the way. Well, if you notice, when water gets reduced, it's negative 0.83. When aluminum ions get reduced, it's negative 1.66. Water's just easier. Just like water was easier to reduce than sodium ions, water's easier to reduce than aluminum ions, too.